Hello everyone and welcome back to Nathan Deer's Guides Everything. Welcome back to The Legend Forge, a series where we take characters from pop culture, video games, TV shows, movies, whatever it might be, and we format them into D&D the best we can. I make homebrew items, I've made a subclass once before, uh, loads of stuff. We go to all the lengths that we can to just make it work. If you're new around here, please feel free to subscribe if you enjoy the content and leave a like and a comment with any characters you'd like me to cover in the future. We've got loads in the pipeline already, but eventually... I will try and get around to all of the suggestions that are in the comments uh, and just thank you for all the support recently it's been fantastic to see coming up today we've got a great episode for you we are going to be covering young vesemir from the new witcher film that's uh, just gone live on netflix uh, the witcher nightmare of the wolf without further ado i think it's about time we get into today's episode of the legend forge witches on me Might have slightly underestimated you. Slightly. Oh. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that. Let's just go straight into it, shall we? Over to my characters, first of all, and then we're going to go down to Vesemir here. And you can see it's one variant. Uh, I do have a few ideas to show you, though, on here. It's a level 19 character. Um, 19 just seemed to work when I was adding it up. I didn't go for 20, I thought perhaps there's still more room for him to learn, but for all intents and purposes he's a pretty high level character, you could go either way with it I think. Um, but obviously we've got the character name, we've got Vesemir or Young Vesemir, um, plenty of homebrew content on and no multi-class requirements, that's important here because we've got another multi-class going on here. Uh, we went for a variant human as the race uh, language, we went for Draconic, I guess that would just be based in like the in D&D &D anyway, that's kind of the basis of most magic, but you could go for Elvish or something along those lines. Uh, but in The Witcher, uh, Vesemir doesn't actually speak Elder speech, which is the traditional language of the Elves, the, the older language of the world. For our ability scoring, we've gone for Dexterity and Constitution out the gate. Uh, for our skills, we've gone for Sleight of Hand. And for our feet, we've actually gone for Skill Expert. And we've gone for Proficiency in ex Investigation, Expertise in Sleight of Hand, and a buff to our Dexterity. And that is to, again, minor spoilers from The Nightmare of the Wolf, if you haven't watched it yet. As a kid, he was a... Not a pickpocket as such, but a bit of a naughty lad. You steal on the streets and things like that, the streets of Cadwen, um, even as a servant to just treat himself, basically. So moving over to the classes. Now, this is a point of contention. I made like four different versions of this because loads of things work for this type of character. I would say if you wanted to emulate what a witcher is actually like in the game or how he's kind of represented in the movie, like Henry Cavill's Geralt, I'd actually lean into more of a strength-based build, but in the world of D&D, Blood Hunters really run on dexterity. There's no real reason to run a strength-based build. The dexterity ones are just better. And equally, I would say the anime film that's just come out, The Nightmare of the Wolf, just because the animation style, Vesemir's like doing flips and stuff everywhere. He's very, very dexterous, very acrobatic. But then I think that just comes into the style of the media as well. That's not something they can really do in live action or I guess in video games it'd be harder to represent that's not how Geralt represented anyway or Vesemir in fact he's an old man in that though so first up we've got three levels in Rogue and this is to um, cover the early portion of his life when he is just a young lad basically before he actually becomes a witcher or at least while he's doing his training so as a rogue we get light arm proficiency um we get i've got proficiency in perception stealth acrobatics and deception and that's just for lying his way out of things as a kid and again the sleight of hand and the stealth it all comes into i've explained it already watch the film by the way it's fantastic i really really enjoyed it we've gone for expertise in acrobatics and thieves tools and now while he doesn't actually like um unlock anything in the film he does steal things so i just figured he probably picked up a proficiency in that at some point in his life. We do get sneak attack as part of a rogue as well, which means we can do more damage when we have advantage on something. We get a cunning action, which means we can dash, disengage or hide. And again, this is very anime style, being able to jump in, jump out, loads of acrobatics. And that's the build we're doing. We're focusing on this cartoonish version of Vesemir here. 
For our roguish archetype, we've gone with Swashbuckler, without a doubt, and that's the fancy footwork feature that we get and the rakish audacity. So fancy footwork, um, it said that Vesemir was actually like the fencing teacher for all of Kemoran as he got uh, older. He was a master swordsman, basically. There wasn't many better. So I figured the fancy footwork aspect of it really kind of plays into that. Less so in like a roguish sneak attack sense, more of a... I could jump at you right in front of you, you know I'm here, stab you and get away quickly because, you know, fencing is quite a, a cagey sport, I would describe it as, if you've ever watched any. Um, but you land a strike, you learn how to slip away without reprisal. If we make a melee attack against a creature, it can't make opportunity attacks against us. Just makes us really mobile on the battlefield, which he absolutely is in the anime. In addition, we can, uh, with Rekus Audacity, we give ourselves a bonus to our initiative rolls equal to our Charisma modifier. And if we just get a creature alone, basically, we get a sneak attack just incredible so we're always i imagine this as like we're very well trained to go for the kill shot every single time as a monster hunter just to cover this here i do believe you could absolutely swap out the swashbuckler rogue for an eldritch knight fighter and then perhaps reduce the levels of the in in the blood hunter class because uh, we do have 11 levels in that so you reduce that a little bit but more into eldritch knight fighter that covers your signs and your magics and things like that and means he's heavy weapon proficient which like in the games and tv shows it seems to be more leaning into that strength based thing it's not that they're slow but it's just that when they swing their swords, they do it with power as opposed to anime flips and all things like that. But again, like I said, this is the anime build. Next up, we have 11 levels in Bloodhunter Order of the Mutant. I went for a proficiency with Arcana. Uh, we get Hunter's Bane. And I've gone, I do have a beginner's guide to creating a Bloodhunter on my channel already, but not one around the mutagens. So I'll go into this in a little bit more detail now. Hunter's Bay, we have advantage on survival checks to track Fae, Fiends and Undead, as well as intelligence ability checks to recall information about them. Uh, we also means we empower our body to control and shape Hemocraft magic, using your own blood and life essence to fuel your abilities. Some of your features will require to make a saving throw to resist the feature's effect. The saving throw DC is calculated as follows. So should you ever need to make one, all that stuff's there. We do get Blood Maledicts, which is a bit of a stretch for keeping it tied in exactly with the witcher but it's close enough it's really really good these are innate abilities these curses that we can place upon things by using some of our own blood now i would probably argue these could be our like very powerful witcher tonics potions that he drinks uh, during the show to sometimes inflict damage on himself in order to be able to get an advantage over the opponent so these blood curses don't fit perfectly with the witcher law but i'll just show i'll show you what i've picked anyway and how you could try and like influence it and flavor it to work in you know in a way that makes it quite witcher-esque so blood curse of binding as a bonus action we can attempt to bind a creature that's one no more than one size larger than us has to see our strength saving throw or have its speed reduced to zero we can amplify it by dealing damage to ourself so we can affect any creature you could literally just flavor this as like a spike chain that you're holding you're gripping which is doing damage to you also for blood curse of the eyeless which is a fantastic ability if you're going to play a blood hunter i'm sure i've gone through this in my how-to guide from before um, but you can use a reaction to roll one hemocraft die and subtract the number rolled from the creature that's coming at you they're immune to it if they're immune to blindness and if you amplify it you can apply it to all the creatures attack rolls until the end of the turn which is really really good it's a fantastic one if you really need to survive or if one of your friends is getting pummeled or something like that you could flavor this almost as like a, a the light of galadriel from lord of the rings or something where you catch their attention and you blind them just as they're coming in i'm sure a witcher might have a magic item like that again it's just all about how you flavor these things and it could burn your hand and that's the amplification as you're holding it and to finish off the blood curse we have blood curse of the bloated agony as bonus action you curse a creature within 30 feet you cause them to painfully swell they have disadvantage on physical checks and uh, so the strength and dexterity and they take 1d8 necrotic damage if it makes more than one melee or ranged attack this turn uh, you can amplify it so the curse lasts for a minute which is pretty good. I'd say this is probably the least useful and the hardest to uh, make witcherfied. I would probably just say maybe this is a curse that we've cast or like a dart with a poison or something in it that we've thrown at them and it causes them to be kind of a bit more sluggish and lethargic that way. For fighting style, we've gone for dueling plus two bonus and damage rolls when we have a one-handed weapon, which is most of the time. You always see witches running around with one weapon or two sometimes, like a sword and a dagger, but um, a lot of the time it's a sword wielded either one hand or two hands. 
You also get Crimson Rites, which means you can do damage to yourself to imbue your sword with elemental power. Basically, and again, this is very witchery, but I guess they do have the runes all up in a lot of the game marketing. Again, not something that appears too much in the show. Um, but the rites we've chosen are Storm and Frozen, Lightning and Cold. And now for where it really kicks off into the Witcher vibes, we've gone for a Blood Hunter Order, we've gone for Order of the Mutant. And you get these things called formulas. You begin to uncover forbidden alchemical formulas that temporarily alter your mental and physical abilities. So this is literally Witcher tonics that they drink in the show that just make them absolute machines at hunting monsters. And this is very witcher -esque. You know, I don't want to say a rip-off, but it's pretty close to. But it's really fun, so who cares? Uh, we can take a mutagen formula known as Celerity is the first one I've chosen. Your dexterity core increases by three, as does your maximum. Uh, this bonus increases further up as we go as well. But you get side effects with all these. Disadvantage on wisdom saying so, it's pretty big. I've gone for the night eye, which gives us dark vision, should we need it. Uh, we also gain sunlight sensitivity as a side effect. We've also gone for percipient, which gives us advantage on wisdom ability checks, but the side effect is disadvantage on charisma ability checks. I went for shielded, we gain resistance to slashing damage. You gain vulnerability to bludgeoning damage. So most creatures, as far as I can recall from the games and things, they don't do a lot of bludgeoning damage, except maybe the golems and things like that. But comes ag across a lot of things with claws, basically. So I thought resistance to slashing damage would be perfect. And I think witches do actually definitely have like a natural resistance, especially when they're drinking these potions. Also went for reconstruction. For one hour at the start of each of your turns, you regain hit points equal to your proficiency bonus if you have at least one hit point, but no more than half of your hit points. Side effect, your speed decreases. So if you need to heal during combat, it's basically a swallow, a healing potion that just keeps you going, keeps you topped up. And again, if you're using your blood hunter abilities to damage yourself and things like that, you're gonna need this kind of thing. I think it just goes with just the hardiness of witches. And last but not least, we've gone with the most anime one, which is rapidity. Our speed increases by 10 feet and you have disadvantage on intelligence ability checks as a side effect. But yeah, that definitely just means we can absolutely move around the battlefield as quick as we like. For our ability scoring improvement for a double into intelligence. At fifth level, we get an extra attack. At sixth level, we get the brand of castigation. When we damage someone with our Crimson Right feature, so that's with one of our like storm attacks or cold attacks, we can choose the Syrian Arcane brand of Hemocraft Magic into it, requiring no action. You always know the direction to the branded creature, and each time the branded creature deals damage to you or a creature within five feet of you, the creature takes psychic damage equal to your intelligence modifier. So essentially, it's a you brand something and they're less effective against you, and I guess, I mean, they take damage if they attack you. So it's fantastic. You can see this is like an arcane circle or like a ward that you place on them. A magical spell right at, towards the start of the Nightmare of the Wolf, Wolf film. There's a character called Deglin, this master witcher. And he like writes a rune on somebody's head that seems to be cursed. And uh, they then begin to, the, the creature that's there begins to struggle and squirm and things like that. So that absolutely works as that as well. We get a strange metabolism feature and this leans into, the, I guess, the superhero, the otherworldly element of witches. We learn to adapt to the toxins that we put in with those mutagens. Uh, we gain immunity to poison damage and the poison condition. And we can instill ourselves the burst of adrenaline to negate side effects of one of our mutagens as well. So we can get that dexterity score increased without disadvantage on wisdom saves and things like that, which would be really, really useful because wisdom saves are very common. For our ability score improvement at level eight, we've gone for a double into dexterity. At ninth level, we get Grim Psychometry. So this is, I guess, leads to the investigation side of a Witcher. If we're in evil places, we can make an intelligence history check to recall information about it. We have advantage on it. And this information gleam can come in the form of visions and things like that from other timelines of the past, whatever it might be. We just get this higher knowledge about those darker things, those darker places. Tenth level, we get dark augmentation. Our speed increases by five feet. And whenever we make a strength, dexterity, a constitution saving throw, you gain a bonus to saving throw equal to your intelligence modifier. And so all the spell casting components side of the Blood Hunter are all based on intelligence, which makes sense for like an investigator, a monster hunter, as it were. And finally, for the Blood Hunter, our level 11 ability is Brand of Axiom. So the brand we were talking about earlier, that one of castigation, which can weaken a creature, draw it out, and you do damage to it if it hits you. They can no longer benefit from illusions and such. And that, again, leads perfectly into what happened in the movie itself. If it's polymorphed or has changed shape, it must succeed on a wisdom saving throw or revert to its true form and be stunned until the end of your next turn. 
and if they try to change again they also have to succeed on the throw again so just fantastic for uncovering creatures that are just hidden in the darkness via illusions or shape change or possessing someone things like that and finally a controversial one i couldn't figure out any other way to give which is how i imagined it the right amount of spells to translate as signs so I won't go too much into this. We don't get any more proficiencies. Our spell casting is on intelligence. We get arcane recovery, which means we recover some on a short rest, which makes sense because witches use their signs quite regularly, or at least Vesemir does in the film. Our tradition is the school of evocation, which means we get sculpt spells, so we can sculpt it around friends whenever we cast an evocation spell. Additionally, we can change our cantrips whenever we finish a long rest and our ability scoring point went for a double into constitution and went for five levels total in wizard again the sign abilities are written things they are learned they are carried with them and i imagine if they were to study further they cannot learn more because i think it's the five elements and that's it but other ways to use them and cast them you could, if you wanted, I guess, little less choice, you could go into Sorcerer or Warlock equally. Warlock Hexblade was very, very tempting. Again, this, I feel, just personally, is the best way to represent him in the animated film. Not necessarily Witches across the board or necessarily the ones from the games. I'd probably build those differently, but this seems perfect to me. For our ability scores, we've gone for 14 Strength, 16 Dex, 14 Con, 15 Intelligence, 11 Wisdom, and 10 Charisma. I would actually argue you could go more into charisma. I'm going to change it now. Why not? To honestly, like 13 or 14. He seems to be a very charismatic guy within the film itself. He's got kind of got that, that sarcastic aspect to him, just like Geralt does in the games. But I didn't want to give him a super OP ability score across the board. But then he is a superhuman, basically. So maybe he deserves that. For our background, we've gone with Urchin because he, did, he didn't grow up the streets alone, orphan and poor. He was essentially a servant, but for all intents and purposes, it fits. With skill proficiencies in survival and athletics and uh, tool proficiencies with the disguise and a poisoner's kit should they need it. Poisoner's kit, I think you could be swapped with like a herbalism kit, which means they could make um, the tonics and oils and things like that that, that witches do. So here we are in the character sheet. Our dexterity saving throws are massive. And you can see we've got a few items here, not as many as usual. What I'll do is I'll do the spells first quickly. So we've got Booming Blade here, disguised as just an applied oil. Uh, Booming Blade, if you hit something, if they try to move afterwards, they take extra damage. And I figured you could flavor this as an oil that takes a second to kick in after you've slashed the creature. Igni Bolt is just a fire bolt in disguise, basically. So this would be the Igni sign shot out in a straight line, a huge range of 120 feet here. I'm not sure that that's very accurate, but again, it's the best I could do with what we've got. I've gone for a minor axie, which is actually just a friend's spell. So advantage on charisma checks. Press the digitation, reminding me when Geralt, you can walk around in the game putting out fires and things by just doing this with his hand. Thought it was quite fun. Minor magical effects, why not? Our first level spells, of uh, which we have four slots for, we've gone for a flat Igni. What it represents to me is, uh, I think it's Burning Hands, and that is a 15 foot cone of fire, and that's the one I use the most in game when playing the witcher 3 for example now we have quen which is just the shield spell so that would be quen is the kind of amber aura that you can set up uh, within the game it doesn't use it in the movie as far as i can remember i only watched it yesterday but yeah so quen is in there disguised as shield we've got a warding ard now i do remember within the Within the game, you could slam your fist on the ground as Geralt and send like a wave outwards of uh, force energy from Ard. And this would be that. A wave of thunder force sweeps out from you. Each creature in a 15 foot cube originating from you must make a con save or take 2d8 thunder damage. So perfect for that because it's originating from you. So you slam the floor. This wave goes out and that is a thunder wave in disguise. Our second level spells, we've got the proper Ard, which is Gust of Wind in the sky. Unfortunately, it doesn't do any damage. I'd probably have to homebrew a spell to do that, but I think this is this works just as well. You've got plenty of other options as well. We've also got Axie, which is uh, su the suggestion spell. We can suggest a course of activity, and Axie is the mind control vibe within the game. We've got Remove Curse, which is a specialty of Witches. I didn't need to change anything there. That's not a homebrew or anything. That is just the Remove Curse spell. We've got Targeted Irden, which is the slow spell, which I thought was really fun because in-game, again, you can 
place like a runic circle on the floor and any creatures like wraiths for example that come into it uh, begin to slowly move towards you they're not as effective the other primary version of Erden we've got here is again leaning into that circle thing again we're not focusing on the slow aspect of this one though we're focusing on us being stronger inside it and things that are under illusions and things like that and when they enter they're revealed all these kind of things so Erden in two different forms as our third level spells right and now we move over to the inventory so only a few things to cover here, but some really, really fun stuff. So we'll start at the top, why not, with the Butcher Medallion. So we've got loads of flavor text there with the origin of the Butcher Medallions. I won't go too much into it. Now, it just mentions its basic abilities and things like that. But this medallion reacts to the presence of magic and danger. While attuned to this item, you gain the following benefits. You can't be surprised and gain advantage on dexterity saving throws against magical effects such as traps and spells. You are aware of all nearby magical effects and creatures within 30 feet. Your advantage on saving throws against being charmed. You do not benefit from these features if you're in an area with a particularly strong magical aura, such as within a mile of a Mithalar or during a solstice. Additionally, if surrounded by magical effects or items, the medallion can also behave abnormally, such as within a mage's tower or amongst a treasure hoard. And all of that there, I believe, represents a medallion perfectly with what it does. Witches are known for basically you can't be taken by surprise almost because this will always hum, even at danger, not just at magic. So it's just the perfect early warning signal, but it does have a weakness. If there's a particularly strong magical aura, it can throw it off. So that's quite fun, but a very powerful item without a doubt. You can detect all magic within 30 feet. You don't know what school, so detect magic will still be useful and things like that, but damn good. Next up, we have a homebrew sword that I've created for the purposes of this. And I will read the flavor text here because I feel like it's quite poignant. Vesemir's chosen blade during his prime as a witcher, Mirthanor. Blade based on Deglin's, but much lighter and wielded with more finesse. A steel edge and a pattern welded meteorite core are all plated with silver for use against monsters. A light fuller that extends from near the tip, and the blade is reinforced by a brass brushed inverted V crossguard with a brilliant sapphire at its centre. Now, this is a long sword with the finesse property due to the amount of time we see him wield it with one hand during the show. And to lean to the fact that Vesemir again is like a master fencer. That would be his preferred fighting style and a longsword doesn't scale with dexterity and we needed it to for the purposes of this build. So I think it fits perfectly and this would be a fantastic weapon in anybody's game. This is a plus two longsword. We get improved critical so we crit on a 19 or 20 specifically though against Fey Fiend's monstrosities and undead. It has the conductive feature. When casting an evocation, enchantment, abjuration, transmutation spell that deals damage, you may roll one additional damage die for that spell. And this is from a moment in the movie where Vesemir stabs through a creature and casts Igni into the blade itself. And it like ricochets off it and seems to have more power as a result. I presume that's the magical aura of the weapon. And talking about that magical aura, we have meteorite disruption. So it's said that meteorite ore disrupts demonic and dark magic. So... While you hold the drawn sword, it creates an aura of magical disruption in a 10 foot radius around you. If magic is present within the aura, you have advantage on intelligence investigation checks to see through illusions and arcana checks to identify signs and learn the properties of magic on an object or surrounding a creature. So leaning into that survival, that tracking investigative aspect of being a witcher. We have one more homebrew item for you and that is the grappling chain and so in the show there's this new invention that Vesemir uses this awesome chain it's like 3d maneuver gear from attack on titan that he shoots from his side and it means he can wrap it around trees and do flips and all crazy kind of things dexterous side of that is kind of anime fighting it kind of has to be to be all flashy but you must have a dexterity score of 16 or more to operate this device if you have a dexterity score of 20 or more you don't roll with disadvantage when firing at its long range this is considered a weapon it's right here it's un it comes under a dagger variant that's the way i made it if you hit a creature with this weapon they are grappled by the chain the target can move freely but they cannot increase their distance from you if the creature is no more than one size larger than you you can attempt to pull them by making a grapple check instead of an attack roll a creature can use an action to remove the chain ending the grapple obviously this goes both ways if you hook a dragon that thing is going to fly away from you despite what this says athletics check it's gonna fly away from you take you up into the sky so be careful 
As part of an attack action made with this grappling chain, you may choose to try and secure the chain to a battlement, window ledge, tree limb, or other protrusion. Your DM decides the armor class of a target before you roll. On a hit, the chain launches from its housing and is secure. As a bonus action, you may choose to activate the chain, forcefully pulling you towards the secured point, or returning the loose chain to its housing. The chain can support no more than 300 pounds, and this movement does not provoke attacks of opportunity. This technology requires constant maintenance and upkeep in the form of black powder and oils to keep it running smoothly at the cost of two gold pieces per day. So I feel like this perfectly represents the grappling chain that he has. He uses it to get around the battlefield, uh, but the range is fantastic. It's a 2060. So if you have that 20, you can shoot and you can move towards them 60 feet away, which would be absolutely huge. But then it has this upkeep element to it. For the armor for him, we've gone for a studded leather, which I think is fair. The witches in the movie seem to have lots of leather and clothes with like metal parts to them. So what I've done is I've just for flavor combined basically what is a studded leather armor with an elven chain, which I've described as witcher chain, because even in one of the final battles in the film, Vesemir has like one side that is a metal pauldron and not the other. So I think this kind of represents the best of both worlds. And I think an 18 armor class is very, very fair in this capacity. Then we also have a dagger plus one, which does get a lot of use in the movie from all the characters, to be fair, all the witches that are there, they love their daggers. But that is it. This is Vesemir, the young witcher, the rogue bloodhunter wizard in this case for D&D. Um, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you can find some use for the items I've created. I'm definitely going to try and convince the DM in my next name to let me have a grappling chain. That's going to be really, really fun. Something to note about some of the weapons. They do require treatment by a bloodhunter specifically, so keep that in mind. And I did want to mention as well... The reason there's only one sword and that's what he uses in the movie i believe genuinely this is just a thing over time because the time of the movie it covers the sacking of kemoran where the humans drove out these witches it seems like before that they only ever used to carry their sword for monster hunting and then they sat to start carrying two because they were hated even more so by humans moving forward so i just thought that was really interesting note there or maybe they just changed styles over time i don't know but yeah I hope you enjoyed this. This has been Nathan Deer's Guide to Everything. Please leave a like, comment, and subscribe if you're enjoying this Legend Forge series. And if you're going to try and use any of my items, if you're going to make Vesemir, let me know what you thought of the film. I really enjoyed it. Again, thank you for tuning into Legend Forge. See you next time. Bye bye. Might have slightly underestimated you. Slightly. Oh.